Thank you again for coming and welcome to the Beyond Aceh session. Um, in that film, I hope it outlined um, and sort of set the scene for you. But what it's really asking is what I believe the most important question is of our century, and that is how much space we leave for other forms of life. And it's not just essential for other forms of life and whether we avoid an extinction crisis. It's essential for everyone in this room and our children and our grandchildren. So this truly is the most critical question. And I said yesterday I was wondering why this symposium in many ways felt so flat. Why we didn't have this sense of urgency when we're quite clear that these targets we, we've set are inadequate, irresponsible for future generations. Now, the point of this symposium, or this section, was to explore the current targets and then start to look into the future. But just to put things in context, we know that about one-fifth of the world's vertebrates are threatened with extinction. And then we've done studies of plants, and we've done studies of invertebrates, and we've sampled representative samples of these groups, and it looks like the threat rates are relatively consistent with what we see in the vertebrate world. We know that current extinction rates are about a thousand times that of background extinction rates. And I said yesterday, we know that since 1970, populations have declined by more than 50% of the world's vertebrates. So we know that the current world's protected area network is just not doing the job. We know that we need to both increase the capacity within the existing protected area network, and we need to expand it in the future. But what we really wanted to look at yesterday was, what is the science behind the, the future of a protected area network? One that will provide for people, and one that will provide for biodiversity. We, uh, we had a pretty clear message when we started to look at it, both in terms of what the people want and what the science is. So, when we looked at what the people want, we found that uh, the public wants about 50% for nature. And obviously, we're down around 3% and around 15%, so much less than what the public ambition really is. And there's other things that, it, that uh, survey really answered that Noel presented yesterday. Many people argue that protected areas are a Western construct or people simply aren't interested in them. But we found that in seven countries around the world, both developed and developing nations, there was strong support for protected areas. And within those protected areas, the reason they wanted them was to conserve biodiversity. The second most important reason for people was to maintain the functioning of the planet. And the last most important reason for them was the economic benefits that protected areas provide. We then started moving from public opinion into the science. And Harvey Locke gave a presentation, and he showed a figure which was quite interesting. It showed generally what political targets are, and then went up to what the science so far is telling us in terms of what we need to put aside for other forms of life, uh, both for averting extinction crisis and for providing the services we need. And uh, we found that it was anywhere from 40 to around 60% that we needed a set aside for nature to achieve um, a solid environment for species and, and ecosystems. Obviously, the science is quite young in this area, and it needs to be further developed. And I think this needs to be one of the greatest messages of this symposium, that we really need to pick up our game on the most important question of our century. Uh, we then started looking more into the marine world, and we were looking at ecosystem services and in the marine system and started asking questions about how much the marine world needs to be set aside. Mark Spaulding gave a presentation and put up some different numbers, but essentially he was referring to a recent study that's come out by um, Callum Roberts, which shows that over 30% uh, should be no take in the oceans if we want to have a sustainable ocean in the future. So that's no take, but much more than that would be under various forms of protection. So again, it could be anywhere up to 50% or much larger that in terms of well-managed oceans. Then we had Dillis Rowe come up and talk about um, the implications in terms of livelihoods, and she was questioning what 50% really means. It's easy to say put 50% 50 side, 50 aside for nature, but does that exclude humans, or could we have some sustainable use within that? Is it a gray area? And so I think in this discussion today, it's really important to think about exactly what that 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 percent really means and what that means for humanity and thinking about not only the values for biodiversity but the values for, for communities. And then we learned that we're all tadpole collectors really and that's why we're really here. It's the engagement we had with nature when we were young and um, that's extremely important for galvanizing and, and motivating future generations and that we can't lose that 
and that we have to realize that a lot of the reasons that people want these protected areas globally is an emotional, kind of spiritual reason. And we shouldn't set that aside and, and go only along with economic arguments. We should also realize that uh, our motivation uh, for conserving a lot of the world's species and ecosystems is, is a emotional one. And then uh, we had a very interesting talk at the end, uh, which started to explore what it might look like if we set aside 50% for nature, and looking at different scenarios. And it was a fantastic presentation, but again, very early in terms of the exploration of this topic. And again, I find it a little shocking that the most important topic uh, is so young in terms of the broader research community. So this is something that we have to think about in this session, and one of the outcomes I'd like to see us discuss here is how we take this research agenda forward. So today, we, we're going to follow on from those presentations. We're going to continue to explore the science, and, uh, and then we're going to move a little bit more into sort of the economic arguments, the value of protected areas, the cost of protected areas, and then how we might plan protected areas uh, into the future. And this process we need to put into place to move beyond that change. So we've got our 17% our our and our 10% targets. But how do we frame this and what is responsible, what is, is important in terms of biodiversity and what is important in terms of ecosystem services? So with that, I would like to invite our first of the four speakers, um, Hugh Possingham. And Hugh is from the University of Queensland. And the title of his talk is ensuring functional terrestrial and marine protected areas. Now after Hugh's talk, we're going to, or after the four talks, we're then going to open up the mic because we want to hear from you. And hopefully a number of you have been in both sessions. And you can come and comment on any of the talks you've heard. But we want you to comment and think about how we take this agenda forward, whether 50% or the, a, a number around that is actually feasible, um, and whether we should really continue with trying to understand what, what the public thinks and then really connect what the public wants and what policymakers are doing into the future.